Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to our house. Again, um, with tonight we're going to do something a little bit different than we normally do. Number one is this will be the last um, lectures that we'll have uh, probably for three weeks till after a week after Pesach, uh, Passover. Uh, uh, there'll be two weeks for Passover and then uh, I'll be out of town, so it'll take a minute to get back. So let's figure three weeks before, maybe even actually probably four weeks before I actually record again. Um, but tonight what I'd like to do is do two lectures on my thoughts. The first one will be on uh, proof that there is a God. Again, as the last words in the Torah that were given was the Ene Kal Yisrael, before the eyes of all of Israel. So we'll be talking about that. And then after we finish with that, I'll take a quick pause and we'll start a second lecture on, again, we're just this week, that will be on uh, Wednesday night, will be again the holiday of Pesach, Passover. So I thought it would be interesting to do a lecture, a commentary on uh, the four sons, again, something that most people know something about, <clears throat> give a little a little different way of approaching it. Anyway, so let us begin. Okay, again, thank you for attending. Um, this week on my thoughts, I would like to answer the question that people often ask. Can, you, can one prove that there is a God in the world? Well, I believe that the answer to this question is yes. We can base the answer on the last three words that are written in the Torah. The Ene Kol Yisro, which translates to mean before the eyes of all of Israel. So the question we have to pose is, what is history? Answer, eyewitness report. So if I were to ask you, did George Washington live? Well, he would probably answer, of course. Everyone knows that he was the first president of the United States of America. Well, that being the case, then of course, he, he must have lived. Again, eyewitness report. Now the question becomes just how many people do you really think actually saw George Washington in the flesh? Well, I believe if maybe 100,000 people actually saw him, that would have been a whole lot. Yet we know and we say with complete certainty that George Washington lived. Imagine, the Torah records that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they numbered some 600,000 men plus between the ages of 20 and 60 years of age. That number did not include those men under the age of 20 and others that were over the age of 60. We would also have to include all the women. So altogether there would have had to have been at least a minimum of 2 to 3 million people that journeyed in the desert for the 40 years. The desert experience, unlike the crossing of the sea or the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, was not a one-day or one-time experience. For all the 40 years that the nation journeyed in the desert, they were surrounded by the clouds of glory, and they were accompanied by the well of Miriam, a sea of water. In addition, they were fed daily by the mun, the spiritual heavenly food that they received from heaven. Every day, except on the Shabbat, on Friday a double portion of mun would fall, so that the people would not have to be bothered collecting their food and preparing it on that holy day. Now the mun that they ate was totally absorbed into their bodies. Therefore, uh, there was no waste product that was associated with its cons consumption. That being the case, they were not bothered with the physical necessity to relieve themselves, which would have compelled them to walk outside the camp uh, to be able to do so. In addition, their, their clothes grew with them and their shoes never wore out. Now, these miracles occurred daily during their 40-year journey in the desert. Many of those miracles were in the merit of Moshe and Aaron, who led the nation for their 40 years in the desert. Now, by virtue of the number of people, the camp of the Israelites would have had to extend at least two and a half miles. That being the case, the nations of the world were able to witness the spectacle of this immense cloud traveling through the desert. When the children of Israel would break camp in their wake, they would leave behind a virtual garden that had blossomed while they were encamped. It was not a coincidence that over 4 billion people today, both Christians and Muslims, followed the Old Testament in one form or another. 
Now, another proof that the Torah is true is that it passed what we call the test of time. We were given the Torah some 3,300 years ago, and yet we as Jews still follow its commandments. We are, by our natures, a questioning and argumentative people. If you have two Jews, well, you have three opinions. As the Torah testifies, God states that for the 40 years that the children of Israel journeyed in the desert, they tested God constantly. This was not a nation that would have accepted the restrictions and directives that the Torah demands if the Torah was not given to them directly from God Almighty himself. The people would not have accepted a storybook that they had not witnessed, but they were eyewitnesses, as it ends with the words, the Aini kol Yisrael, before the eyes of all of Israel, to all the events that the Torah relates. However, we do see that both Christianity and Islam have also passed the test of time. So, does that mean that they are also true? The answer is, of course, no. In order for a person to tell a lie that will be accepted, they must first base it on a truth. Once they do that, then they can build their lie on that solid foundation. Both Christianity and Islam base their religion on the Old Testament. That truth allowed them to build a lie that still exists until today. Where the, where, where the revelation of Mount Sinai was witnessed um, by the whole nation, which consisted of some two to three million people at the same time, Christianity is based on the eyewitness report of a handful of questionable people. And Islam's claim is based on the testimony of Muhammad himself and his horse. So based on the last three words written in the Torah, we have indisputable proof that there is a God that exists in the world and he has chosen the children of Israel as B'ni B'chari Yisrael, his firstborn nation. The Torah ends with the words again, the Ene Kol Yisrael, before the eyes of all of Israel. Rashi commenting on these last three words states that with these three words, God is complimenting Moshe for breaking the tablets before the eyes of all the people. But the question that we must ask is, did Moshe really break the tablets or did the tablets break by themselves? We recite in the Shabbat morning Amida, the standing prayer, Ushnei luchot savonim horid biyado. And Moshe, he brought down the two tablets of stone in his hand, which tells us that Moshe was able to carry both of these tablets in one hand. This can be compared to the ark that housed the Ten Commandments. It is said that the ark weighed some 36,000 kilo. There was no way that only four men would have been able to carry it. Yet, that was the case. There were only four men who were chosen to carry the ark whenever the nation traveled in the desert. How was that possible? The answer is that the ark, in reality, carried itself. They just put their hands on the poles. So too, and Moshe carried the tablets. Moshe did not need any physical strength to carry them since they really carried themselves. But once he saw the golden calf, well, then the letters flew back up to heaven, and then it became dead weight, and he could no longer hold them, and they were broken. Now the Ramban states that when the letters flew back up to heaven, the tablets became too heavy for Moshe to carry, and so he let them fall from his grasp. However, as they were falling to the ground, he may well have pushed them away from his body so that they would not fall on his feet. It's hard to believe that God Almighty would have complimented Moshe based on the fact that he had pushed the luchos away from his body as they were falling. Uh, there must be more of an answer to this statement. So the Gur Aryeh, based on the Talmud Yerushalmi and the Tractate of Tainus, <clears throat> states that after the people began to worship the golden calf, God told Moshe while he was in heaven, Lech Raid, go back down. The Torah describes the dimensions of the tablets as six handbreadths long, three handbreadths wide. It seemed that as Moshe was leaving the top of the mountain, he was holding on to two handbreadths of the Luchos, and God Almighty was holding on to two handbreadths of the Luchos. There ensued a wrestling match, so to speak, between God Almighty and Moshe. Somehow, Moshe was able to win, and he was able to snatch the tablets out of God's grasp. He then proceeded to descend down the mountain. 
with the two tablets in his hand. The Torah states that this is the reason that in the verse, the Torah refers to the Yad Chazaka, the strong hand. This is an allusion to Moshe's hand that was able to wrestle the tablets away from the hands of God. Imagine, if Moshe had come down from the mountain without the two tablets, what could he have done to bring all the people to their senses and make them realize the travesty of their transgression? How could he have brought the whole nation to the point of tshuva, of repentance, all at the same time? But he did bring down the two tablets with him when he descended from the mountain. He entered the camp carrying the two tablets, which made a deep impression on the people. They were able to see that the writing on the tablets were the work of God. As our sages tell us, that the people were able to read the words written on the luchos from all four sides equally. In addition, the Hebrew letters such as the Mem or the Samach have the shape of a donut. Miraculously, the holes in these letters did not fall out. They were suspended in midair. The al on the portion of Kisisa states that when Moshe entered the camp and he saw the golden calf, it forced all 620 letters of the Ten Commandments to fly back up to heaven. Every person that was in attendance was able to view the letters leaving the tablets and then floating up into the sky. Once the letters left the tablets, they no longer carried themselves, which automatically brought about the breaking of the tablets. One can only imagine the shock that the people must have experienced at that precise moment. It brought them back to reality and caused them to realize the gravity of their sin. As the verse states in the portion of Kisisa, and the children of Israel stripped themselves of the ornaments that they had received at Mount Sinai. These were a gift from above at the time when they accepted the Torah. These were the crowns that they had merited when they declared the words, Na'asev and Ishma, we will do and we will listen. All of this occurred only because Moshe had brought the two tablets down with him after he was forced to descend from the top of the mountain. Had he had listened to God and left the Luchos, the tablets in heaven, who knows what the outcome of their sin would have been. You know, it's customary to end the book on a positive note. That being the case, well, why would Rashi, in his final commentary on, on the Chumash, the five books of the Torah, make, Mosh, make mention of Moshe's breaking of the Luchot, considered by many as the most severe sin committed by the nation? The Talmud in the Tract of Avodah Zorah states that it was not within the character of the Jews who had been just been redeemed from Egypt to have made a golden calf especially just 40 days after receiving the Torah directly from God Almighty himself. The Talmud states that God gave the Sutton, the devil, permission to cause the nation to sin. God gave his consent in order to introduce the nation to the concept of tshuva, of repentance. God Almighty wanted the people to reach the highest plateau possible, that of being a Balachuva, a repentant individual. As it states in the Talmud, the Mokam, Jabalia Chuva Omdim, in the place where truly repentant individual stands, even a truly righteous person cannot aspire to. So we now understand that the Torah ends not with an allusion to sin, to the sin that the children of Israel committed, but rather to the act of Chuva, which atoned for it. Our sages tell us that the beginning is always wedged in the end. We see evidence of this connection in the first and last three words written in the Torah. With the completion of the last three words that Moshe wrote, the Ene Kol Yisroel, before the eyes of all of Israel, we are now able to better understand on a much deeper level, actually the first three words of the Torah, which begins with the words, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning, God created, based on their eyewitness testimony, we can be certain that they were redeemed from Egypt and supported for the 40 years in the desert by the same God, Pubara Elohim, that God created the Word. Rav Nachman of Breslov stated that we end the reading of the Torah by recalling the act of Moshe breaking the Luchot. Then we immediately begin to read 
the Torah anew with God creating the world. By Moshe's act of breaking the Luchot, he invoked the kindness of God to forgive the children of Israel. But not just at that time, but also any time in the future. His action allowed the nation to begin again with a new sense of commitment and enthusiasm. Let us remember and never forget that there is a Father in heaven who loves us all dearly and only wants all goodness for us. And with that, let us hope to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, what I'd like to do is stop here for a second. And what I'd like to do is again continue um, tonight with another topic on my thoughts. So I'm going to stop my recorder and again begin again.